Good morning everyone and welcome to Hasbro Christian Fellowship. It's Sunday the 4th of October and when I say welcome to Hasbro Christian Fellowship it is an absolute delight this morning to be able to be worshipping with a fairly small group but to be able to he be here worshipping at Hasbro Christian Fellowship. You're not watching this live, we have pre-recorded it, we are easing ourselves back into being at the church, but it's so lovely to be here this morning. And for those of you joining us on Zoom, it's equally great that you're here. And for those on YouTube and watching us from wherever, you are really welcome joining with us this morning in whichever way you're joining with us. Um, we're going to start our worship together this morning by singing the song Pray, which is based on the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, high above, hallowed be your name revealing us today who you are. Let's open up our hearts in prayer and worship as we sing this or meditate on the words together. And a few words from scripture. 1 John chapter 3 verses 1 to 3, some of my favourite verses from the Bible. See what great love 
the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God and what we will be has not yet been made known to us. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves, just as he is pure. We're going to sing two more songs together now. And these are both songs that talk about the, the light of Jesus shining across our land and the light of Jesus shining through us, through those of us who trust in him and follow him and believe in him. So we're going to sing the, the song, Shine Jesus Shine, Fill This Land with the Father's Glory. And then we're going to follow that by singing, Come Set Your Rule and Reign in Our Hearts Again. Let's sing. Shine on. 
was great. Build your kingdom here, let the darkness fear. And we pray that God will build his kingdom through us, through our words, through our actions, through the ways that we treat other people. Uh, Linda is going to open with prayer for us now. Thank you, Linda. Good morning, everyone. Shall we pray? Father, I just thank you that we can approach you as we are. Thank you that you welcome us into your presence. Thank you that we are loved by you, and not just loved, but deeply loved. 
Father, we thank you that whatever each one of us has been going through this week, you know us so well, you know our hearts, and you know what we need to hear this morning. Lord, we just offer our lives to you afresh today. We want to draw closer to you. Lord, as I've been reading in Hebrews, give us that patient endurance that we need, that whatever situations we face, we know that we are there with you, and we know that it's something that you can bring us through because you don't change. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Our circumstances change, but you are constant, and we thank you for that. Lord, we pray for those who are really struggling at the moment, that you will really draw close to them. Speak to their hearts. Give them the words that they need to hear. Lord, challenge us if there are situations where we need to be the ones to bring those words of hope. We just pray for your guidance, your wisdom, to just be your light, to be your people in the society that we have at the moment. Lord, we thank you for the ways that you're working in all of our lives to draw us deeper to you, to, to delve down into those areas that you just want to work in, Lord. Help us to just surrender those areas to you afresh. And again, we just pray that every part of our service this morning will honour you, will lift you up, and that we will really draw closer to you and we'll really learn more about you in our time together. We thank you for one another. We thank you that we are your family here. And Lord, as your family, we want to be knit together, but we also want to really express the beauty, the majesty, the wonder of who you are. Thank you again for our time together, Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Linda. Just a couple of notices. Um, we did say we would be doing a collection uh, for Birmingham City Mission. We won't be collecting food stuff, but in lieu of harvest, we will be collecting money. We send uh, money to them for their food bank every month anyway. But this is a month where some people might bring food stuff who don't normally. So if you want to send some money in lieu of a harvest celebration this year, then please uh, let Jeremy have it or I can pass it on to him so that that can go to Birmingham City Mission. And uh, also we are open for Sunday morning worship. We are doing this a week at a time. And if government guidelines change again, and that's looking as though it might happen if lockdown becomes stricter again, then we may have to uh, stop meeting in church again for a while. But, but for now, we have reopened the church building for Sunday mornings. You are very, very welcome to come and join with us. But if you want to come and join with us, if you want to be here in person, can you please let me know beforehand so that we can keep a list of who's coming to make sure that we don't exceed our maximum numbers that we can have in here. Uh, we're going to sing again, and this time we're going to sing Jesus went out of his way, out of his way, out of his way to help others. So if you've got the energy, then why not stand up and join in with the actions? Jesus went out of his way, out of his way, out of his way to help others. Jesus went out of his way, out of his way, out of his way to do right. So let's go out of our way, out of our way, out of our way to help others. Let's go out of our way, out of our way, out of our way to do right. When I was hungry, did you feed me when I was thirsty? Did you give me a drink and I sighed out? Did you welcome me or did you turn me away? Jesus went out of his way, out of his way, out of his way to help others. Jesus went out of his way, out of his way, out of his way to do right. So let's go out of our way. Brilliant. I'm always a bit out of breath after that one. 
David is going to be speaking to us this morning and he's going to be speaking to us from 1 John chapter 2. Uh, before David comes to speak to us this morning, let's sing one more song together. Let's sing the song, Christ be beside, be beside me. And again, let's make this a prayer as we uh, pour these words out to our Lord Jesus. Let's sing and then we'll hand over to David. Christ be Good morning everyone, it's really good to be uh, able to share with you this morning um, and just before we start let's just pray and commit our time to the Lord as we seek his guidance through his word. Let's just pray. Lord as we come to your word now, pray that you will reveal yourself to us, Lord that you will encourage us, that you will challenge us, Lord that we might be aware of your presence with us. So, Lord, all that is said and done, may it be through the power of your Holy Spirit. Take anything away that is not of you, Lord. Help us to worship you in hearing from you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. We've been going through, um, well, I've been going through the letters of John. Well, we have actually on the first letter. So I'm going to continue um, with that this morning. And just to kind of put you into a brief recap, remember John is in his old age and he's probably based at Ephesus. He's writing to the churches in the area of Asia Minor, which is um, currently Turkey, the area of Turkey. And he's having to write because he's trying to counter some of the false teaching that's creeping into the Christian church. It's beginning to spread itself into the local churches. Um, if you remember, we called it Gnosticism, I apologise if you spotted my undeliberate error last time that I spoke uh, on John's letter because I said agnostic so many times instead of Gnostic. But we're talking about the Gnostics and not the agnostics. But hopefully I'm not going to mention that word too many times uh, this morning so um, <laughs> we won't get too confused. We saw that, that John's opening salvo in chapter 1 was to declare that Jesus is God. And he was able to declare that from the very point of view that he had authority because he was an eyewitness. As a disciple of Jesus, he was there. He saw Jesus' life, the miracles that he committed, that he did. He saw Jesus' death and then his resurrection. And so he quite openly declares that Jesus 
is God. And then we saw that John was expressing how important it was to walk with God, to walk as Jesus walked, to walk in the light. And that we saw how the the gospel is Jesus Christ, that he is our advocate, our atoning sacrifice, propitiation in the King James Version, uh, a translation of scripture. And finally, in chapter 2 and verse 6, we ended with, with the words, whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. Not the ministry of silly walks of the Monty Python days, of those of you that remember that, but to walk with Jesus was to imitate Jesus, that we should imitate Christ's faith, imitate Christ's love, his devotion, his obedience, and his selflessness. So we're going to pick up on verses 7 to 17. And really it's all about an unchanging command in a changing world. The emphasis is on love, that commandment to love God, to love others, and to live our lives as Christians in a world that is actually dominated by the evil one. So let's just read scripture, shall we? And uh, it's from the first letter of John, chapter 2 and verse 7. Dear friends, I am not writing you a new command, but an old one, which you have had since the beginning. This old command is the message you have heard. Yet I am writing you a new command. Its truth is seen in him and you. Because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother is still in the darkness. Whoever loves his brother lives in the light and there is nothing in him to make him stumble. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. He does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded him. I write to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, dear children, because you have known the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God lives in you and you have overcome the evil one. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the cravings of the sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. May the Lord bless his word to us. Do you wish sometimes that kind of the world would come to a bit of a standstill, especially when it comes to technology? I certainly do. We're always kind of having to upgrade things, aren't we? Get the latest upgrade on an electronic device. I was digging in one of my bags the other day and found uh, one of the old iPods that we, we bought uh, one, of our, one of our children for Christmas. And I was kind of glancing through and it, at how you could make a selection of music. And it was a series of images of the covers of all the, the albums that I had um, stored on on the little iPod and it was great and I thought oh this is brilliant I really like this but you can't do that anymore because it got upgraded it got changed well maybe actually you can still do it but I just haven't found it because there's so many different options that you can search through it gets kind of confusing doesn't it and sometimes I just wish that things would stop but you know it's good to remember the saying that if it if it ain't broke oh, I'm gonna get this wrong so if it ain't broke don't fix it if it ain't broke don't fix it What John is saying in this letter basically is say, hey, you don't need to upgrade anything because what was true then is true now and it doesn't need tweaking in any way. You know, we see that the ministers at the moment 
uh, government ministers getting all kind of mixed up and confused about all the various rules for lockdown over COVID and it's getting really confusing. But John just lays down one rule, the commandment of love. In verse seven, he says, dear friends, I am not writing you a new commandment, but an old one, which you have had since the beginning. This old command is the message you have heard. He's stating that this commandment of love, it was there right at the beginning. If we get look in the book of Deuteronomy, we read these words that are given to us. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. And then in Leviticus, in chapter 19, verse 18, do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbour as yourself. I am the Lord. But then it almost seems as if John's contradicting himself because he says, yet I'm writing you a new commandment. Its truth is seen in him and you. Well, that new commandment, that old commandment, it's the same. If it ain't broke, don't fi fix it. It's about the love of God. And we see Jesus, the words of Jesus in Matthew's gospel. Said, Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbour as yourself. All of the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. And in John, this gospel in chapter 13, a new commandment I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. The old commandment, the new commandment, it was the same commandment. And John is writing that this is what you should be doing. It hasn't changed and it doesn't need to change. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. John starts off that verse seven with the term dear friends, sometimes translated dear children. It's one of his favorite comments, but it shows his pastoral care and his love for those that God had um, put under his wing to teach and to protect. And in verse eight, it tells us about the fact that this darkness is passing and the true light is already shining, a verse of hope. Things are changing. When it talks in scripture about light, it's about God's truth shining on a dark and ignorant and a sinful world. He uses that phrase, true light. It's only used twice in the New Testament and, and John uses it. He's talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Who, as we know, as John writes, Jesus Christ, the light of the world. And from that gospel comes its saving effect for those who put their trust in Jesus. But in verse 9, John goes on to make a very strong contrast between this light and dark. He talks about hating your brother. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother is still in the darkness. Whoever loves his brother lives in the light and there is nothing in him to make him stumble. That great contrast but when he's talking about hate here, he's not really talking about uh, emotions, but attitudes. Those attitudes of hate that are expressed very often in the actions that people take. And he talks about, in verse 11, being in that darkness. About the darkness blinding. And those pictures of that darkness is, is often used to symbolise uh, rejecting God's truth and continuing in a life of sin. Again, if we look in John's Gospel, in chapter 3, verse 19, light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. And in 2 Corinthians, chapter 4, verse 4, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. And then as we go into verses 12 to 14, we get a declaration that our sins are forgiven through Jesus. 
I write to you, dear children, your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. Wow, the wonderful thing that our sins are forgiven when we trust in our Lord Jesus Christ. And he's declaring that this message, this gospel message, this good news is greater than all the evil that is around. Now the verses themselves seem a bit strange. It talks about fathers and children and Bible uh, theologians kind of come up with two ideas about it. If uh, you're kind of confused, as I was, and had to look this up kind of thing. Sometimes it, people interpret them when it talks about children and fathers and young men. It's symbolic of stages of spiritual maturity so in a Christian's life. Or alternatively, others have said, well, when he's talking about little children, he's talking about the readers that are reading the letter. When it talks about father, it's about older believers and young men, younger believers in faith. It's not really that critical to know or understand fully which it is which. But then John goes on in verse 15 to warn us about loving the world's system that is opposed to God. In John chapter 12 and verse 31. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. In James in chapter 4 verse 4. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, for anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. And 1 John, John also writes again, the world the whole world is under the control of the evil one. John's not talking about the world of all the people that are around us and we shouldn't have anything to do with them as believers. He's not talking about the created world. But he's talking about the realm of sin. It's the world that is controlled by Satan and organised against God and his unrighteousness. Verse 15, it talks about the love of the Father. God's love for us, but also our love for him. And then in verse 16, we read, For everything in the world, the cravings of the sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does, comes not from the Father, but from the world. John's not saying that everything in the world is evil. It's not, is it? God created it. It tells us in Genesis, God saw all that he had made and it was very good. But what he's talking about, those are, are those examples of sin that we need to avoid. God has put human desires in our hearts so that we love other people and we join together in matrimony. And we can have desires for things. They're not bad. They're only evil when they're expressed in ways which God did not create them for. And then John brings in the hope at the end of verse 17. The world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. All the world's stuff will pass away, but the believer who is seeking to walk in the light, to walk as Jesus, will live forever. It's a journey, a pilgrimage that we're on, which we are coming to an end point, and it's planned by God for each one of us if we put our trust in him. Well, having thought about those verses, I was thinking about it, and maybe, you know, what we can glean from those verses. Do you know, I think sometimes we often struggle, don't we, to be a beacon for Jesus, to be a light. We often kind of don't speak up when we could do, when God gives us that opportunity. We kind of cower and we hide our light under the, the stand, under the bushel, under the, the pot, as it were. But, you know, we're still seeking to walk in the light of God. It doesn't mean that we're walking in darkness. And if we're walking in that light, still people will see the love of God in the way that we act. Even if we don't, or we kind of bottle it at the last minute and come out with a, a, a message about the love of God to somebody. People will notice in our actions and our lives that we are walking the way that Jesus walked. And so, in a sense, John is, is addressing in this section 
the hypocrites, those that were pretending to walk in the light, these people that were trying to infiltrate the church with false teaching. They were altering the gospel of Jesus. And they were two-faced because they were pretending to be walking in the light and being all holier than thou, as it were. And yet what they said and they did was coming from the dark realm. And it was creating confusion. They'd been seduced by Satan. It's that old story, isn't it, of good and evil, of light and dark. And the big proof that John is writing is saying, well, actually, to show that you're walking in light, it's your actions towards your brother, to your neighbour or to your fellow man. It's not for us to judge others, but we can assess and evaluate. You know, as, as sinners, even Christians at times, we walk in the dark, don't we? I know that I do. Don't do the things that God wants me to do. We have negative thoughts. We have negative attitudes. And very often we're judgmental towards other people. I think Jesus' Sermon on the Mount kind of highlights that, doesn't it? About the thoughts that we can have that we shouldn't have. But because we are believers, then we can recognise when we've got it wrong. And we can come to God and ask for his forgiveness. And we can repent and turn around and seek to walk in the light and not have those things that are of the darkness. But you see, the non-believer, if you don't believe in Jesus, you'll not recognise God's light. And you carry on walking in darkness. So you will hate your brother. And you will continue to hate your brother, your neighbour. Why? Because it infringes on what you want. But God says, walk in the light. You know, we're called to do two things. That old commandment, that new commandment, it was simply to love God and to love others with the same love that we have for God. In other words, walk as Jesus walked. It kind of reminds me of a, quite a few years ago now, doesn't it? That axiom that came through, WWJD, what would Jesus do? And I think John's letter challenges us that if we're going to love our brother, you know, what would Jesus do? Would he moan about foreigners, immigrants coming along and supposedly taking our jobs? Would he be racially prejudiced against people with a different colour of skin? Would he put people down on his, and shame them on his Facebook or Twitter account? You know, let's not get caught up in the evil of the world, which is so manifest around us. We need to walk in the light. And it's perhaps here that we, we can become beacons of light and stand up for what is right and just and to stand up for Jesus. But it might come at a cost and we need to be prepared for that. We will face opposition because we're encroaching on enemy territory. But we know the end result of the story. We know that Jesus Christ is victorious. The enemy has been defeated. And in the final battle, Christ is victorious. We're told the final outcome. And John reminds us in this part of the letter that the tide is changing, that the light is coming, the light is here, the darkness is passing away. And the true light, Jesus, is already shining. Is Jesus shining in your life? Do others see Jesus in you? Remember that Jesus is coming. Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. Amen. Let's just pray. Lord, again, just come to you now. Thank you for your love for us. Help us to think about your words. Help us to think about what you want to say to us. Lord, help us to walk as you walked, Lord Jesus walk in the light, to bring your love and your compassion, to love you, Lord, with all our heart, and to love our neighbours as you call us to. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, David. Let's finish our time together this morning by saying the grace together. Now, May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ 
and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Thank you.